Hey, Discern listeners, Love is Blind. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. If you are a cast member of this show or any of the shows that I watch, keep in mind that everything I'm saying is based on the edit. I'm sure you know this, but, you know, don't take what I'm saying as a replacement for a proper assessment from an in-person clinician. Let's watch. I feel so happy. How does it feel? I think what they're trying to focus on is her fingers, at least I hope, <laughs> that she's maybe having nervous finger fidgeting or something. Anyway, at least they're editing it this way, and who knows? Kind of looks like she's trying to have a conversation, and he's not responding much at all. This is totally in line with my observation of the two of them. That I mean, that, that they fist bumped after having that conversation about race. We haven't seen much of a connection between the two of them. It could grow. It could be there off camera. I don't know. The other thing I'll say is you don't have to constantly talk in order for there to be love and connection. It's what some people want to do all the time, but other people are okay with just being silent or together. Um, some people get really anxious with that kind of space of, of silence. You know, maybe they're in love and connected and they have had enough fist bumps for the day. <laughs> so they're just going to sit in silence. It certainly doesn't look that way. And really, I'm starting to wonder if there's a quiet resentment or anger uh, toward each other. Uh, it kind of looks like Kenneth is refusing to engage, but I don't know. Uh, so I guess a, an hypothesis that I can put in the top three list is that he doesn't like her. Or, well, I guess another possibility is that he's insecure. We, don't, we just don't know much about Kenneth or her. She comes across as more fluid and flexible. He comes across as pretty shut down generally. We haven't seen a lot, but that, that, that's the theme that we're seeing in the edit. So is he terrified and thus he's shutting down? Is he just a real quiet guy? I don't know. And I'll say it again, as I said in an earlier video, typically, not always, when you are that in love, supposedly, in the beginning of a relationship, you can't help but to interact and hold hands and to look in each other's eyes and to hug, not always and not 24 seven, but you would just think there would be something there to indicate love and affection. So it just kind of looks like they're not really, it's a weird, you know, uh, with this season, because last season, there were so few couples that made it even to the later stages. And even of the ones that did, they had to edit out for some reason. So this season, when they had five, they're like, oh, okay, it's not six. Other seasons, they get six. And other seasons, we get even more than that, right? Or maybe it's always been six, you know, with Zach and I um, and um, Bliss, because they were like, anyway, you just think, okay, we're back, we're back in business with like an average of two that say yes, yes at the altar. Well, it's only five, but okay. Uh, uh, but then when you think about it, and I'm looking at the list right now, um, really, Amy and Johnny are the only ones that I would put money on. And we don't even know that much about them. Uh, they seem, I didn't show this scene, but they were both saying that they actually have physical chemistry. They have that spark for each other. They seem to be genuine about it. So that that's a big deal, right? That's That, that can really carry the day for people. Meaning that if they run into a speed bump if they have that kind of, you know, I would say that Chelsea and Jimmy seem to have that as well. They're pretty quick to look into each other's eyes and touch and hold each other. So there's that. Laura and Jeremy uh, seem kind of in that direction. AD and Clay seem to have that. Brittany and Kenneth don't seem to have that. But at least we're hearing that Amy and Johnny have that. So I don't know why it matters to me, but I, I feel like I need at least one couple that is in the direction of Lauren and Cam. <laughs> Just give us something to, to, to cheer for. 
I love that. Have you ever swam in the Bahamas before? Oh, yeah. like, no! You never have? I no, have. No, you have? In the Bahamas, yeah. It's lit. It's an amazing experience. And the dog. Are they going there? It kind of looks like they might. Uh, uh, I don't know what the what the morality of doing this to the dolphins is. So I don't know if we're watching a scenario where they're, you know, they care very well for the dolphins and their holistic needs are being taken. Because, you know, you can feed an animal and keep them safe, but if they don't have their territory to roam or people to interact with or things to do in the day, it, it can drive an animal literally crazy. So I don't know if they treat the animals well. You know, like I could see a scenario where the dolphins are uh, generally free to go and then they come back and they're just there for a day or I don't know. It's hard to imagine that it's humane to do anything along these lines. And Stacy and I were in Mexico last year in Cabo actually and had heard that they had something like this and it was really tempting because it just seems amazing <laughs> to be, <laughs> you just think, you would never have an opportunity to do that, to swim and actually hang out with dolphins. But they had this, they had that ability to do that. And I think it was not even just dolphins. I think it was also like other kinds of mammals of the sea. And I, I was like, oh, it just, but then, you know, you think about it, it's just like, it, I just imagined myself in the water while someone was taking a picture and the dolphin was being trained to do this song and dance for me. And it, it just, it, uh, yeah, it felt exploitative and icky. So I don't know what we're watching. Do you know, is it, is it a good life for them or is it somewhat horrific or is it completely horrific? What's going on? I had his name was Ken. Shut up. I fell in love with dolphins because of that. You got me talking though. Literally, I loved it so much. Can I have dolphins on um, aisle two? Okay, so he acknowledges, you got me talking. So it, he knows, and that is the dynamic, that she's trying to get him to talk. Because I didn't know if they both just weren't talking. So she's trying to get him to talk, and he's like, well, you got me talking. So what's going on there? Is that just his style, or is it a, is it a defense? It usually is. When people are in a situation where interaction is called for, people usually want to interact. <laughs> you don't have to extract it from someone. So usually there's some worry, some trauma of rejection or humiliation or conflict or something. So he's saying, you got me talking. And now she's making a joke like, oh, please, can, can we have dolphins all the time? <laughs> so at I think they're what they're telling us is that even off camera this is happening, which isn't hard to imagine. Eh. Eh. Then you think Kenneth false advertisement. You're in the pods. You're talking all the time, presumably. Now maybe he didn't. Maybe they sat in silence in the pods. Hard to imagine. Maybe he told her. By the way, I'm kind of quiet. It's also kind of strange because you know you think a principal that there'd be a fair amount of extroversion or talkativeness that would be required and would lend itself to you being hired for that position, you know? Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Come on. Maybe Kenneth just needs to, his pump just needs to be primed. He's in love with them. And they're so nice and like just. You give your dolphin kisses on the nose? Yeah, I did it. I did the whole, I got a picture of it. Literally. It was crazy. Okay, well, they're talking. It's still not the sort of talking you would think you would see with fiancés, but maybe they'll get there. Okay, <laughs> they're doing a pretty good job with the editing of the sound and the music for this economy of time. You know, the way the song just went, <laughs> It's like, oh, here we are again where he's being silent. So, uh, what's going on, Kenneth? What's going on? What's going on with you? Is this how you want to be? Is this how you are? Is this how you resort to this? Do you resort to this? Are you afraid of something? Are you hurt? Would you like to talk about that? What's going on? Um, 
I am very, like, you see how I'm, like, always, do you appreciate, like, do you like that? What is your view on physical touch? I love it. Now that we are physically together. I love it. Talk I love more. it. Like, you. Yeah, that's good. So it's a good way to start because it involves something likely positive. It's not talking about something that Kenneth probably doesn't have feelings about. So, you know, reach out. Hey, do you like this? And she, he says, I love it. Okay, that's good. And by implication, Kenneth, maybe some expression would, would help the relation. Because she's kind of saying, I don't even know if you want me to touch you. So that's good. I love it. And then she says, tell me more. And then he, he seems to know. He lies. Yeah, yeah. He seems to know. So that kind of lends itself to him thinking this is like, like his policy. Like he prides himself in being quiet. Is this a toxic masculinity thing? That can happen sometimes. I mean, he certainly doesn't come across as someone who would adhere to those sort of things. But, you know, there's a lot of aspects of toxic masculinity, some of which involve stoicism and unemotionalism and lack of talking. And some people are just quiet. So I don't know what's happening. Lingo, combined lingo. Um, physical touch to me is a, it's a way you affirm someone. Like, yeah. It's a piece of security. Okay, so are you touching her? <laughs> if that's how you feel, is, I wonder if she'll say something. You touch me, make me feel good. Good. I'm very, I have always been like someone that is a way that I show my love and like just having like my. We've been in this situation before. I'm trying to remember who it was, but I remember people speculating. And, you know, it's a worthy hypothesis for some level of intensity on the list, you know, top top five or something, um, that he, oh, it was JP and Taylor that people thought that he, Kenneth, and maybe JP, upon seeing who he matched up with in the pods, is like, whoa, she's a lot more attractive than I thought she was going to be, and I am not in their mind. So this is uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. Now, JP ended up saying that he thought she was, that Taylor was disgusting because of her makeup. Doesn't negate what, uh, well, it kind of negates it because when he saw, well, I don't know. It doesn't really negate it because he could say like, wow, she is a very beautiful person who doesn't normally go for someone like me. I hate the makeup. You know, it could have been, could have been that. So I, you know, we'll add that to the list. We'll acknowledge that that's, that's a possibility. And he's like pre-taking himself out of the game because it's like, well, what's the point? I'm not going to extend myself just so I'm going to get rejected. I mean, it's kind of a stretch because, you know, they fell in love and there's no reason to believe that Taylor or Brittany is not into their person. Um, if anything, uh, it was, it's a really similar dynamic, actually. <laughs> JP was quiet, too, in this way. JP was more awkward, though, when he did talk. But it's a similar dynamic. Uh, hmm. Yeah, you just you just want to get JP and... Kenneth, he's like, what's what's going on? You know, tell tell the full story. But of course, that would require talking. And it's possible that, uh, well, I can use this as a jumping off point. There are a lot of benefits to talking. Obviously, as a talk therapist, I would say that are not necessarily understood in this rational, logical sense. You know, you often hear people like, well, what good would it do to talk about it? And it doesn't, it's not going to change anything. And what I say is, it changes everything potentially. <laughs> talking, just talking to someone, even if you're just by yourself, journaling. But there's a kind of a magical, not not actually literally magical, but a, it taps into something that's very human for us, which is the need to talk something out and to have someone understand us and ask questions, be interested, have empathy. It transforms. That's what therapy is based on. And when I have trainees who are terrified going into their first few clients and they're like, I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, I will tell them this. It only kind of gets halfway into their skull because they're just so terrified and they're t they're sure that they're a terrible therapist because they don't know what they're doing. But, um, you know, I'll say all this to them. It's, it, I'll say what people want is to be heard and understood. When you go to therapy, what do you want your therapist to do, particularly in the first session? Do you want them to tinker with you, to find that 
uh, you know, that problem area in your brain and switch it differently? Or do you want to be seen? Do you want to be given a chance to, you know, talk it through and to have someone be inquisitive about your experience to ask questions that get you to explore deeper? You know, isn't that what you want? And it doesn't take a genius. You were probably good at that before you even entered graduate school. So do that. Now, being a therapist is much more than that, that graduate school offers, but that's that's what people want. So for uh, talking, it can help, you know, when you're saying stuff to someone else, even if you're more on the reserved, quiet, or introverted side, you still want to do that. And it has a way of helping us understand ourselves, helping us work stuff out. For some quiet people, they weren't modeled that or had it shut down somehow or something. And therefore, it hinders their ability to have any self-awareness about anything. You would think that someone who was very quiet would have a lot of self-awareness because they would be thinking a lot. And it certainly can be the case. But for a lot of people, especially if they don't journal or something, some kind of expression, you know, putting neurons together that explore an idea, uh, then what can happen is not only are they quiet, but they have little awareness of anything, their emotions, their thought processes, their needs, their wants, their dreams. And it can cause them to alienate more people and it gives them more reason to shut down and be quiet. Addiction can often grow out of this because it's there's too much suffering there and you don't know what to do with anything. So I don't know what we're looking at with Kenneth, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm kind of worried about it because of the two people, if they break up, I would worry a lot more about Kenneth than I would her. Um, now, maybe she's got issues too. We haven't had a chance to find those out because there's been only a fist bump between the two of them. It's like something that I don't like. That's what I want though. Yeah. I know mean, I'm always touching you. I'm always touching you. Hard not to. I think, I think that you do a very good job of like remaining like, I don't, I don't think that you, you don't touch think me like... Okay, this is good. So he's saying, I touch you all the time. I think I touch you too much. And she says, I don't think that. <laughs> so, so maybe that's what he's doing. Because if he's not going to be talkative, then at the very least show affection while you're on this romantic date kind of thing. And so maybe that'll help. And maybe it'll grease the wheels for him to be able to talk. It just seems like some sort of strategy is because when he talks, he seems like he's pretty comfortable. So like unlike JP, who when he talked, there wasn't a single sentence aside from when he was getting dumped, I think was the first time he actually spoke in a relatable way. And so for Kenneth, is he, I guess an hypothesis we can add is he is trying not to impose himself on her. <laughs> and he's doesn't want, he's like, I'm not, okay, don't, in his head, he's like, go stop touching her and stop talking to her. Give her space. And she's like, why is he doing this? Is that what's happening? I really did not, I really did not know that, like, you really love, like, physical touch, like, seriously. Yeah, I do. <laughs> like, I really be thinking I'll be smothering you. You don't smother and me. And that's crazy. You like, do not. Like, you do okay, this is great. This is very, very promising. <laughs> the first promising thing I've seen. So not only is he uh, adjusting well, but he's also showing that he wants to, right? That he's showing, like, well, I really want to have physical affection with you all the time. I thought I was smothering you. So that is great. I wonder if she was giving some sort of signal. It'd be hard to imagine because she seems very free and open with him. He has some kind of trauma around that, some sort of paranoia. That's interesting, yeah. And, you know, we can add racism to the possibility, right? Like, say he's 15 and he likes a white girl at school and they go out on a little 15-year-old sort of date thing and he's like, okay, he moves in to kiss her and she's not ready and she says, like, ah! and then he concludes that, as a black man, you know, there's internalizations of being aggressive, hypersexual. I don't know. <laughs> so at the very least as a man, I can say that things are different in good and bad ways for younger men. That for younger men, on the good side, 
they're much more aware of sexual harassment and boundaries and consent, like so much more. When I was young, <laughs> in high school, there was a movie called Sixteen Candles. There is this scene or this story, this mini storyline at the end. I mean, I'll spare you the details, but essentially a major storyline has to do with a woman having zero consent. She is so drugged up that, of course, and everyone knows that she's so drugged up, there's no possible way that she could be consenting to having sex with Anthony Michael Hall's character, the nerd. And she's like the popular girl. And none of us like her because she's the popular girl and she's mean, but that doesn't mean that she deserves to be raped, right? So she's you know extremely messed up and she thinks that Anthony Michael Hall is her boyfriend is Jake, who <laughs> my whole life I've been trying to get my hair just just like just like his. I feel like I'm almost there. Uh, it's quite a hunk. <laughs> so she thinks that Anthony Michael loves him, and then they have sex. And when I saw that in the '80s, when I watched that movie in the '90s, that scene right over my head. Just like yeah, that's a scene. That's kind of funny. Now <laughs> she wakes up the next morning and it's like. I kind of liked it. It doesn't make that doesn't mean it's okay. You can't retroactively no harm, no foul, apparently, but ick, you know, what kind of message are you putting out there? Well, it, it, it's a it's a message and it's an absolute reflection of the way things used to be. Women don't deserve consent, especially if they're slutty or on substances. If you can trick them to score with them, then you win the prize because women don't matter. And rape isn't a thing unless it's uh, someone jumping out of the bushes. You're a good person. You can't rape anybody. You know, just, uh, just, yeah. So young people are very much more likely to not have any of those really horrific misogynist. I mean, true. People throw around the word misogyny to me, in my opinion, a lot. This is true hatred of women. And uh, uh, young, young, now I'll say that. <laughs> Eventually, you know, and it wasn't just me, it was everyone in my cohort, you know, and it wasn't just me that, by the way, that thought that scene was totally fine back. You know, there's a, there's another scene in Porky's that um, was notable when I was like 11 uh, that seemed, you know, anyway, and Sixteen Candles, a beloved movie, uh, there was zero talk from, I'm sure someone saw it, I'm sure feminists and you know, other women, maybe some men says, well, that's not good. But, you know, plenty of parents let their kids go to that movie. You know, there was, there was no problem with that. With that. Today, that movie would be burned at the stake for a, a good reason. And it should be burned at the stake. I still want my hair to look like Jake's, but that's a whole other thing. And I love that last, the ending song, when they kiss over the, and the, and the credits start to roll. It's, um, oh, I get chills. Such a great song. Um, oh, such a great song by Thompson Twins. I actually recorded it. Maybe I'll play an excerpt right here. I, I did a cover of it. It's on my SoundCloud. Um, oh, it's such a great song. But would you suspect my emotion wandering? Yeah, do not want to part of the same more. Um. So I am saying all this because on the pro side, younger people, younger men are much more likely to understand that and to not do things like that and to not stand by as those things are being done around them. Much more likely. Does it still happen? Absolutely. Are we out of the woods yet? No. <laughs> There's such a thing called Andrew Tate. But on the downside, I have heard from a lot of younger men, even not so young, like I, men in their early 40s, that are terrified about coming across as creepy. And what they decided when they were young, because they you know, were properly educated about the harm and the problems of misogynistic rape culture, all that kind of stuff, they overcorrected to, to make sure that they never do that. And that's well-intentioned, but what it does is it makes them overly assuming <laughs> that they're being creepy and overly assuming that no one wants to touch them. Because that's, you know, it's kind of a, a message that if you're not careful when you're teaching 13-year-old boys about this kind of stuff, if you're not careful, the 13-year-old boys could walk away saying like, oh, 
whenever I have an impulse to touch or kiss, uh, that's, that's bad. That's a bad impulse. And no one wants that, right? And this is uh, one of the things that came up when I did sex ed for 13-year-olds. I was in charge of it. And I was free in the beginning to do whatever I wanted to. Eventually, the district um, clamped down on me, <laughs> not because I had, I had a bad uh, model. I, I, I think I, I had a pretty good model, but it just was out of the norm. You know, the norm is fear, is STIs and anatomy and abstinence. Even in liberal Seattle, it's just safer, right? And of course, um, it wasn't like I was teaching 13-year-olds about, you know, gangbangs or something, you know, but I um, included really at the request of the students because I developed this program over time. And the a lot of times I'd be like, okay, what do you want to do with this? What would you like to see? And almost always what would come up for them is they'd say, well, you know, we get the anatomy stuff, we get the STI stuff, but that's really, you know, so far in the future for us. What I want to think about at the age of 13 is when do you decide to have sex with someone? What, how do you know that it's time? <laughs> how would you know that you're ready? What'll, what'll it feel like? You know, they're just thinking that one step now, of course, STIs need to be, it's not like they can't get pregnant or an STI or something the first time they can. The other thing that they wanted to know about that wasn't typically included in sex ed education is why do people like sex? <laughs> there seems to be a lot of uh, energy around sex. And is it good? What's good about it? I don't understand. <laughs> you know, so they wanted to just understand why people would even engage in the first place. And so uh, in addition to anatomy and STIs and all the fear shit, which is you know, necessary, and the talk about abstinence and the talk about date rape and that kind of stuff, we would talk about in a group format with, I don't know, sometimes we would do skits because <laughs> kids like to do skits about uh, um, when to decide. How do you say no to someone? How do you say yes to someone? How do you know you want to say yes? Have you talked about with yourself or if you want to involve your family, which some people would, about what the criteria are. You know, some people would come up with that for them, you know, if they're religious, they'd say you have to wait till marriage, but there's things that are allowed before that. Uh, another person might say, well, I think that for me, I want to be in love and in a relationship for six months, and then I think I want to have sex. Um, another person would say something different. You know, there's just a lot of different um, things, but without a place to talk about it, they're left for on the internet to talk about it, or TikTok, which does have pockets that are good to talk about this sort of thing. So anyway, my point is, is that you have a lot of young people and Kenneth is in that group where maybe he walked away from all that information with a lot of good information and a lot of good awareness, but it pushed him so far that he just has this general assumption that unless there's like overt indications that his sexual energy is creepy. And she worked really hard and really well to uh, break him of that, even though there wasn't overt indication. So she's intuitive or she's just trial and erring around. And now they're free. Now he's free. He's like, oh, I didn't, why was I, you know, he's, he's saying, why was I assuming that? Uh, let's rewind that. I really did not. I really did not know that. Like you really love like physical touch. Like seriously. Yeah, I do. And maybe she gave gave off signals along those lines, but it didn't look like she was. And so it's interesting that he just assumed that, right? Now it could be some family trauma around this too, right? But at the very least, it's notable that he assumed it, and he's acknowledging that he assumed it, and he's acknowledging I think that it was wrong, right? But why would you assume that? And I don't know, but I've also dealt with another aspect. And I think this really spans the age groups for a lot of men, heterosexual men, who will assume that, because if you follow traditional gender roles, the ideas pumped in your head in traditional mainstream American society anyway, that men want sex, they're horny all the time, and women tolerate sex. Uh, instead of the reality in which there's a bell curve of interest in sex and energy around sex with a lot of people in the middle 
where regardless of gender, people want to have sexual uh, interactions. They want sensual interactions. They want physical touch. And there might not even be a difference between genders unless we consider the cultural uh, you know, indoctrination that can start to push the two bell curves aside a little bit. And I even remember when I, when I was in high school, I had friends that didn't have much confidence in this department. And they, you know, let's say that they ask a girl to the prom or something, and they're like saying things like, you know, how do I, how do I get her to, um, to kiss me? How, how, what, what do you think you know, we should do? And, you know, they weren't asking me for advice because I was an idiot just like them. But I, I do remember telling some of my friends something to the effect of women like sex, too. <laughs> women are into kissing. You don't have to impose it. You don't have to get them to do it. Hopefully, you're both participating equally. You know, you don't have to drag the girl into it. It's like, just let me be clear. I'm not saying that every woman wants it therefore all you get you can just do whatever you want to women no <laughs> yeah. like i really be thinking i'll be smothering you you don't smother and me that's crazy you like, do not like, you do not smother me at all in your physical touch that's good to know. like i kind of at one point mm -hmm. i did think i was like mm, i don't really know if he's into me it was great that needle of prognosis is starting to get way more positive all of a sudden the other thing I'll say, and I don't know if this is a factor, is Kenneth is a is a big guy, and I don't think I'm as big as him. I don't know how tall he is, but uh, I I grew up real fast, and I felt like a monster. Truly, <laughs> it did come in handy though. We, we played this one game at recess where whoever was it, you know, it's basically like tag. Whoever's it, everyone has to is trying to tackle you, and so what people typically did is. You would just, and this was an illegal game. Like we couldn't play on the regular playground because the the school aides would tell us you can't play that game because it was flat out violent without any pads or anything, just for regular school clothes. If someone was it, you had full reign to just take them out physically. You know, you couldn't punch someone, but you could do everything. But and it came in handy because I was so big that no one could take me down. <laughs> they, <laughs> But boy, did we get our exercise. I mean, just, we were, just imagine how sweaty you'd be just for you know, the entire recess, just running for your dear life or carrying five people on your back. Anyway, and I remember not like this in this way, but I remember feeling like I was like a, like a monster, like I was in people's way, that I was something that needed to, I'm, I'm thinking there's got to be like a cartoon about this or something or a... Pixar movie where you just feel like I'm just gonna be quiet in the corner because if I act or do something, you know, I might hurt someone or I might break something, you know, because when you grow fast, you also lose coordination. You, you don't realize that your arms or your body is as long as it is, and and it can be alienating. You can, and I did. I I, I remember wishing I was one of the short, cool kids, the boys, they were more coordinated. I hadn't caught up to my body yet. Um, they were more popular than I was, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I, I just felt like this tall, lanky weirdo. And I wonder if that's another factor that for him, he has some experiences with that and just feels like by default, I am an imposing large man who people will try to avoid, you know? And I guess it didn't help that when I played sports, the opposing teams would be terrified of me, particularly in football. Because, <laughs> you know, you imagine, right? Um, now, I was bumped up to like an older league because of my size. But, but I remember kind of feeling that. Like on one hand, it's like, yeah, people are afraid of me. That's, that's, that's cool. But then on the other hand, it's like you start feeling like you're a, like a Sasquatch or a, a bear or something. You know, <laughs> I'm a human. Mm, it just gives me like more insight. Yeah. I won't say better. It just gives me more insight about you. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. Like that's definitely new. I've never. I've always heard I'm overly affectionate. So. Oh, okay. So. That says a lot. That he was hurt. Yeah. He's always heard that he's overly affectionate. Hmm. Huh. 
I wonder what's going on there. Yeah. And maybe he is. Maybe if he lets loose, then he's too affectionate. Yeah. Okay. Well, that explains a lot. He's not trying to mess it up, but inadvertently messing it up, which is what happens with the fences. Just me personally. I would never be like, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hands are so big. Now, arguably, he's still not extremely affectionate (laughs) because she's the one leaning in and all that. She's the one turning to him when she talks to him and he's just staring. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but this is, you know, encouraging. And, and, you know, maybe there's a lot of variability to this and it's enough. It's just kind of hard to imagine that he would be overly affectionate and that multiple partners of his in the past would state that. I'm going to take a guess and say that something went horribly wrong in a relationship, a relationship that he references that was very painful to him. And maybe toward the final phase of the relationship, as he was still exhibiting normal affection or even clingy affection because he sensed that he was losing her and she would get upset and say, you're always touching me or you're you're too affectionate, like stop. It really hurt him. (laughs) And then the relationship ended and it really hurt him. And so he just locked it in, just like shut that down, shut that whole thing down, don't ever do that again. I think it's worth using it as a jumping off point for a common issue in relationships. I would say particularly the uh, the older the relationship is, you know, further into the long-term relationship, that we, one, will tend to cool down on physical affection in general, not always, but also people can get into a rut or a pattern in which they just avoid, they just you know, they, they might have an impulse that is either noticed or not noticed to get a need met for affection and closeness and togetherness and touching, maybe even sex. And the individual with that urge will, maybe even there's not a lot of conflict, but the, the person is like, eh, I, I, I don't want to bother the person or I don't need to. And then the other person feels similarly and neither person act on those impulses. And then it just creates this discomfort or lack of familiarity or assumption the other person doesn't want to over time. You know, that happens to a lot of couples. So it's a similar thing to what he's recognized. Like, wow, I I was making this assumption. And there's a very good chance that in your relationship right now, that you both both people would want more touch. It might be not exactly the kind of touch that each person wants. You know, some person might want more sexual touch. The other person want, might, want, might want more intimate touch, you know, cuddling, this kind of thing. It's not always the same, but um, in terms of like the initial foray into touch. But generally speaking, most couples want all the forms of touching, um, maybe at just different ratios or in different orders or something. But there's a good chance that if you were to put you know, just turn up the dial a little bit into taking that risk a little bit more, acting on it a little bit more, and your partner does the same, that it will really enhance things. You know, it's it's one of the reasons why I think a lot of Americans, anyway, I can speak to that, maybe other cultures have this as well, why we have so many pets, because pets don't have that insecurity, typically, and will reach out and touch us, or they'll ask to be touched, or if you have a cat, they want to be in your lap, that kind of thing. And there's no insecurity or pretense. And so as a human, we don't have to extend ourselves or they don't protest very well. You know, if your dog or cat doesn't want to cuddle, um, you can overpower the animal, (laughs) you know, not as uh, in an abusive way, but, you know, you, you can pick up a cat and sort of make it conform and, you know, it'll enjoy it for a little bit. And then it's like, okay, that's enough. And you put the cat down, but you're, you're getting some of your touch needs met. And I, I'll stand by that. I love cats and dogs and I love um, cuddling with them, but there's a lot, I think of over dependence on that, or it's just a sublimation. It's, it's a, it's a, it's at least something in our lives that we're getting that 
need met when we really want to do that with our pets, but also with the people in our lives. But we've just given up for one reason or another, maybe because of the assumptions that he's making or something else. And so I I think it's worth thinking about. All right. Well, I want to remind everyone, if you want to support what we're doing here, you can become a member of the YouTube channel by clicking the join button below, or there should be a link in the description. And by becoming a member, you are literally paying my bills so that I can pull time away from other things and dedicate the time and energy to YouTube. You're also paying for uh, you know a handful of other people that work on this podcast. You're also giving some money to charities that we support. If you want to see a list of those, you can go to the website. And uh, but really, uh, you're you're paying my bills mainly, <laughs> which makes it so that I can have a roof over my head, so that I can watch the show with y'all. And um, so. Uh, and for those of you who, who are already members, it's great. A benefit of being a member is that you get access to member-only videos. I usually will post one a week, um, sometimes less, sometimes more. I, I shoot for one a week, I think. And also, I respond to your your comments. Um, even if it has zero upvotes and it's at the very bottom of the list, I sort by member comments and, and read them um, because I want to reward the members. But also... Uh, it's easier for me to remember members because <laughs> there's a uh, I like to have a relationship with the audience. I like to have familiarity with individuals. And so um, when I see members, uh, you know, because I'm much more likely to, to look at member comments. And when I see people commenting a lot, then I, I, I get to know that person's personality. You know what I mean? So and that that makes me feel like I'm connected to actual humans and not just ones and zeros on a screen. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.